What's up, friends and family? Thank you all who watch these videos. It's an absolute blast making them, and if you enjoy them, please like and subscribe. It goes a long way to helping make more of them. And if you enjoy the, the panels and discussions, consider joining the Hurt Panel Forum's Facebook group. And you can join in the Zoom discussions live when they're happening, ask questions, be a part of it. It's a lot of fun. Anyways, I was just re-watching my last panel with Lori Dillon and Dr. Lofman about bridging the gap between the hobby and herpticulture and herpetology to try and find a good clip to share. Mm, and I really couldn't. And it's not because it wasn't good, uh, but I just felt that the whole conversation just really needed to be listened to in all. And I think that's probably the biggest gap between herpetology and herpeticulture. It's just attention span. But if working with reptiles has taught us anything, it's that we need to be patient. So please check that video out. It's linked right here. And honestly, it's an absolute gem, if I say so myself. Anyways, a few weeks ago, I had a panel with Riley Jemison, Summer Mitchell, and Lucas Lee to discuss beginners reptiles. Now, this wasn't your typical conversation. You won't see any top five lists. You won't see any bottom five lists or dream reptiles or any of that. No sponsored content, no box store promotion, or a lot of the stuff you'll find on the big YouTube pages. This was an honest, insightful, and well thought out, thought out conversation that you want to listen to from start to finish, just like the last discussion. So thanks again for watching this channel. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoy learning something. Check it out. Record on this computer. So welcome. We got a few guests joining us right now. Um, we'll wait just a moment while some folks log in, um, even though I think we might have just a few on today. So that's great. Um, and, and a few late stragglers that I'll, I'll let in as we go. But everyone, welcome. So today I have a... Uh, uh, an expert panel. Our, our, our topic comes from one of our panel panelist members, actually, Summer Mitchell. So Summer, uh, she started, uh, she has a YouTube channel, a Girl with Scales, and or excuse me, just Girl with Scales. And she had a really phenomenal YouTube video that, that just came out recently. And it was all about um, what's the best beginning pet reptile. And she came to a really terrific conclusion that a lot of folks don't come to. And that conclusion was the one that's best for you. Um, and it's, I, I think it's, that sounds real simple and real easy, but uh, it's something you don't see a lot on YouTube. Most YouTubes are like, coming at you the five top YouTube reptiles for, for you. And it's like corn snake, ball python, uh, king snake. And for maybe a lot of people, maybe that's not the, the best option. So um, I'll, I'll take this time now, I'll introduce my panel. Um, I'll ask Summer to unmute herself there. And um, we have uh, Summer Mitchell, Girl with Scales. Uh, check out her YouTube channel, Hi Summer. We have Riley Jemison with Riley's Exotics. Hi, Riley. And Lucas Lee with Centralian Exotics. Lucas is um, Lucas and Riley both also are part of the NPR podcast network. So if you guys like reptile podcasts and uh, and they have YouTube stuff too, um, which I think most uh, most podcasts now are pretty much absorbed through YouTube is, is my kind of experience with it. I think it's more popular there. I don't know. I don't keep this as a podcast. There's too many steps for me, and I'm lazy. Um, but uh, that's that's really good lessons. They got a lot of really great conversations. Some strictly reptile related and sometimes they go off the beaten path which i really appreciate and but well guys we'll, we'll jump right into it so welcome everyone um let's introduce yourselves tell me how you work with reptiles and how you first got into them and, and we'll start with you summer uh so i work with reptiles in a couple of capacities i am a keeper so i have a small a small collection at my house um that i take care of mostly moralia carpet pythons australian pythons and um then I also work at uh, Jacob Oka Reptiles doing not animal care, although I did in the past, but now I do um, some sales stuff and some video editing and social media. So, Awesome. How did you first get into him? Uh, I'm local and I offered to clean poop. Uh, I mean, I got paid to do it, but yeah, I started cleaning cages and um, that whole thing. So I guess I stuck around longer than most people. So. <laughs> that's it right I think most of the uh, the older I get I think most jobs are this way but especially like in the community and the reptile hobby when you get to know someone it's just 
you get places just by sticking around and showing that you're willing to to do the work right a lot of times and just um introducing yourself and having a yes mentality right yeah. and then um we'll, we'll welcome summer uh, welcome to the panel happy to have you lucas how about how about yourself introduce yourself for for the masses sure um yep so my name is lucas um like summer i keep and maintain quite a few uh reptiles at home mostly australian pythons uh, morelia aspidites um a couple false water cobras uh, professionally, I uh, used to work at the East Bay Vivarium, which is a large herpetological store here in California. <laughs> and I also uh, work as a field biologist for an environmental consulting company. And a lot of my uh, responsibilities there involves um, a listed species of whip snake mm. and surveying for those guys. Um, and at the moment, I am in grad school uh, pursuing a master's degree in zoo science and biology as part of the uh, evidence-based herpeticultural lab uh, with Dr. Zach Lofman at West Liberty University. Nailed it. Um, and that was, uh, Zach was a, a, a panelist on a, a previous episode of ours too. He was, he's fantastic. So I'm, uh, I'm a little jealous that he's your, your professor. That sounds pretty awesome. It's so great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. It's a, uh, I, I kick myself every time I meet someone in college. They're like, what should you study? I'm like, biology, herpeto, you know, study what you want to learn, right? So that's awesome. Um, welcome, Lucas. Happy to have you on the podcast. Um, podcast, whatever, YouTube. Uh, Riley, uh, introduce yourself. We've, we've had you on a, a panel before, um, but uh, introduce yourself to folks who don't know. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So currently I manage GXC reptiles in Sacramento. It's a retail outfit uh, for reptiles and exotics slash a breeding facility for uh, a lot of pythons, boas, monitor lizards, things like that. Um, anything that's uh, something that we could potentially breed, we're trying to be more sustainable in our breeding, including insects and feeders and everything. So kind of a new age of a reptile shop there. But in the past, I have worked in AZA accredited facilities uh, managing or being part of a team managing the reptile collection uh, at the Sacramento Zoo, Santa Barbara Zoo, and I've uh, just grown up with reptiles ever since I was a little kid, and they've just always been my thing. I've always gravitated towards them, and now I make them uh, make them my my day job, my hobby, and kind of surrounded by them. Clearly, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a, that's pretty sweet. That's a, a nice little close confines to be within there. Um, yeah. Well, welcome to the panel, Riley. We're happy to have you. Um, and for those who don't know, my name is Steven. I'll be your host today, um, but we're not going to talk about me because um, I can uh, do that on my own. We have uh, a, a few questions. We'll jump right into it. And folks, if you're watching here from the audience, and if there's a question you want to ask, feel free to just chat it in at any time. Um, I'll take some of them at the end as well. Um, but yeah, feel free to, to use that if, if you have any questions that you wanted to uh, incorporate. Um, but we'll start right away. So we'll start with Summer. Uh, let me ask you this. What is the dumbest mistake you've ever made as a reptile keeper? So for those who, who are just tuning in, we're, we're talking about um, beginning, uh, you know, your beginner snake, your first snake, your first reptile. So this panel hopefully is for everyone who doesn't even have a reptile yet. Tell me, um, tell me the worst mistake you ever made. Made many, but I would have to say really the worst mistake I ever made was getting too many animals too fast. Um, like and what? Young of an age. Um, like when I was 11, I got my first snake and I became obsessed. I loved it. Um, I learned everything. I went on the internet, learned all I could was, and then I was bombarded with all these other cool animals that I didn't know existed and you could ship them and get them from all over the country. And I was internet savvy. So I was having people mail me things when I was 12. Um, I was shipping things out when I was 12. It was, and nothing like fatal happened, but it did result in accumulating more animals than I could handle as a 12 year old. Um, and as a result, most of, most of those animals had to be rehomed, which obviously is not ideal. So yeah, definitely my worst mistake. Um, it was well-intentioned, but yeah. Oh, totally. I could see, I mean, I know adults who, who fall into that trap, um, you know, 35 year old men, for instance, uh, who, who get a, get an, an animal or a reptile. And it's like, Oh, I wasn't ready for this. You know, now that I have to find space for where's this going. So yeah, that's a, a huge 
huge thing to, to think about is just slow down, right? Um, good advice. What, what about you, Lucas? What, uh, what's the dumbest mistake you've ever made? You know, um, I, I feel pretty fortunate in that nothing terrible has happened yet under my watch, which is good. Um, I, I think one thing that sticks out to me is uh, when I was first getting started, um, I really struggled with proper probe placement. Like once mm. I actually got a thermostat, you know, at first I didn't even have a thermostat. I was running a bulb on a dimmer like most beginners find themselves doing. Um, but yeah, once I finally transitioned to using a thermostat to really dial in my, my temperature controls, um, I definitely wasn't doing a very good job of, of knowing where to put it. And I uh, <laughs> had it in a situation where the snake could access it take a dump on it, you know, do yeah. things that influence what that probe is reading. Um, and yeah, I just had uh, some some not great temperature issues with the ball python that did end up getting a respiratory infection, um, which is yeah, the only illness I've had to deal with thus far. So that was something that that I struggled with a lot, um, figuring out where to put that thing and, and how to keep it somewhere that animals aren't going to mess up the temperatures you think you're giving them. That's good. Uh, I mean, it's not good, but it's good advice. That's a good thing to keep in mind, right? Like just the details. It's not just about thermostat, but where do you put the probe? Um, yeah, excellent point. Riley, what about you? What's what's some of the dumbest mistake you've ever made? I think I, I've been pretty fortunate to avoid a lot of the common pitfalls. I've definitely, um, I, I guess I would say that the dumbest thing I've done was following the trends and the masses in what to keep and going headlong into ball pythons, not once, but twice when they weren't a species I truly cared for. Mm -hmm. What did you, what, what made you think you had to do that? Well, the first, the first round was just, you know, I was starting to find these other species. I started with rainbows and crebos and king snakes. And, and then I found the whole hobby through, you know, YouTube and ball python. So I did that. And then once I, you know, opened myself to the rest of the world, I realized that I, the ball pythons were overwhelming and how much was out there. Mm -hmm. And they didn't really do anything for me outside of that. And so I got rid of them and made a conscious effort to just keep things I liked. But then the second time it was like, oh, well, maybe I'll try these again. And maybe I can, you know, like them if I go for what I truly like. And maybe I can do this, you know. And I just, once I got them again, within like six months, I was like, oh, yeah, this is why I don't like these things. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just they didn't, they didn't do it for me. And, and I, I went for it twice because of uh, just, you know, that's what was kind of put out there in the forefront, like, you know, shows is 90% ball bythons, YouTube reptiles is 90% ball bythons. Totally. So, yeah. And, and I'm so glad, I mean, even Facebook and, and discussion groups are big time that like the general snake population, snake, snake keeper mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. I can't say how many times I've been on a board and someone saying, oh, I'm considering a hognose snake for my first, oh, I'm considering a rainbow boa or a carpet python for my first snake. And someone says, don't start with those snakes. They're tricky, they're just, start with the ball python. Mm. But then you end up with an animal. I mean, what's the one in St. Louis? Tricky. It's like, it's one, it's tricky. It's just as tricky. It's just yeah. cheap at Petco. Um, but also you're ending up with an animal that, I mean, the one in, I think in the St. Louis Zoo, was it? They just said it was like 41 years old that mm -hmm. had, you know, um, so you're getting an animal for 41 years that you're just like, well, I thought I had to start with this one, you know? It's oh like, yeah. I worked with a 40 year old uh, yeah. male that, you know, he had glaucoma and cataracts and liver disease, but like, you know, <laughs> dude was 40 year olds eating and climbing trees and like, whatever. That's so, rad. Yeah. What, what about um, a, uh, a big mistake? Has anyone committed a, like a, a big fatal mistake? If specifically no one, with reptiles yeah yeah and we could uh that's another that's for another podcast lucas <laughs> <laughs> oh. bad joke uh but thankfully no not no yet. such thing no, no such thing um, so go ahead summer i'm gonna say no i don't think so I, although my family growing up we had boa constrictors and our adult male 
boa constrictor got out one he got out and we found him then he got out again never to be seen again and this is like a seven foot snake um, oh, and you never found him again nope r.i.p um his name is he was he was awesome but yeah just back you know not good knowledge about how to properly secure being mm -hmm. clean, i guess my very first snake because i i had no knowledge um i i you know I, I, this was before the age of iphone so i didn't have the internet in my hand um i stopped at an exotic store i picked up a um Nablakia, a Tarahumara mountain king snake, which are easy snakes. And I put her in my empty 10 gallon fish tank and taped over the, uh, with scotch tape, taped over like the little mm. flaps that you feed. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, the flaps that you feed the snakes from or the, the fish from. W would you believe that the snake got out that night? Um, he yeah. got out, that was in, uh, or actually she found out later. That was in the fall of 2007. I found her in the spring of 2008 um, <laughs> <laughs> after she found a nice place in my Westwood apartment to brewmate. Um, but but that story ends uh, on an even sadder note. So I found out she was female when she became gravid and eventually became egg bound and, and passed away. Oh. And the whole reason why she never passed away, I never, I didn't even have a humid hide. So this snake spent her life with a heat mat that had no thermostat, um, a, a, a light that was just on above it too. So who knows how hot that hot side was. Um, never a roommate and never did anything. At, and then like the first winter I figured out everything and I, I learned all the tips and tricks of, of how to regulate temps and everything like that. Um, I brewmated her and all of a sudden I think her, her hormones just went on this regular cycle and she uh, laid, or tried to lay a, a clutch of slugs, you know, in for legs and she had nowhere to put them. So she just retained them. She didn't, cause she didn't have a nice human lay box. So just little things like that really, really inspired me to, um, become to to do research and that's what told me like wow so this snake and she lived through everything she got out um you know i fed her right so at least i was doing that i wasn't feeding her like chicken nuggets or anything but uh <laughs> she got out she went through everything but she still passed away because i didn't know one thing about you know her biology one didn't know she was a female uh thought she was a male called her a boy um two like just didn't even realize that she would need a place to lay her eggs so that was a, a, a big disappointment. It really opened my eyes just how much I need to read into these animals before I get them. Um, yeah, and uh, so, so talking about the care, Tara asked uh, um, Lucas a question. So I'll, I'll, I'll read that to, to, to you, Lucas. To get further elaboration, what was the best placement you discovered for the thermostat probe? And does that placement change depending on the type of enclosure, if it's PVC, glass tank, racks, et cetera? And I'll even throw an extra wrench. Does it change if it's uh, um, a different type of heat element as well? Oh, Lucas, sorry, I muted you. There we go. So I'll ask that again. Does the, uh, <laughs> does the thermostat <laughs> probe placement change? Yeah, um, so thankfully I, I did figure something out that works uh, pretty well for me. Um, a lot of my caging is, is like this kind of melamine uh, type of thing. And I have been drilling, um, there's these little plastic brackets that kind of have a loop for the probe and then a hole for a screw. And I've been screwing them to the back wall of the enclosure, um, just a few inches down from the heating element itself. Um, I really like that in, in these sort of cages because the animal can't access it, can't move it, can't, you know, defecate or, or urinate on it. Um, so it is no longer being influenced by factors I don't want to influence it. Um, and I find that I'm able to get pretty steady temperatures that way um, because it is pretty close to the actual heating element. Um, and then I do have one rack uh, at the moment and I have the probe um, directly on top of heat tape, um, not inside of a bin, just kind of to the side of a bin in the middle of the rack. Um, yeah. Directly yeah, on the, the heating question? element, right? Not inside yes. the, the tub. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Um, what about taping it down to the bottom of the, the substrate? I've seen people do that or suggest that before. What do you think about taping it? I try to keep tape out of yeah. areas that animals can access whenever possible. Um, I, I do have my probe um, affixed to the heat uh, using that aluminum foil tape. But again, it's outside of the bin because, mm -hmm. you know, snakes have nothing to do all day but explore. And if that gets dislodged and your snake gets stuck, 
um, that can be, that can be not good. So yeah, best to I, not, if you can avoid it. Absolutely. I think that's the first thing that anyone learns about a, a snake is just how incredible they are at digging into things that they're not supposed to be digging into. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if you have an adhesive substance in there, um, odds are they're going to get it all over their scales and maybe uh, peel their scales right off, which is never a fun right. bad, is it? Right. Yeah. And, you know, as close as you can get that thing to the heat itself, the better. Um, the farther it is away, the more temperature fluctuation you're going to have um, just because of, you know, environmental shifts. Excellent. Uh, Lucas, we'll stay, we'll stay right with you. Let me ask you this. What makes any reptile a beginner reptile? Well, I also like summer and, you know, I think Riley has said as well, I don't love that term. Um, I think that it can be uh, misleading and put certain animals in a box uh, that maybe, maybe that box is counterproductive for, for what we're actually trying to figure out here. So I think that what constitutes a beginner reptile is going to be specific to you, the perspective keeper. It's not going to be based on the reptile itself. Um, and Summer does such a great job of breaking that down in her YouTube video on this topic. It really is more about what you are looking for in your reptile pet and what you're getting yourself into, what you want, um, you know, what actually interests you and, and what you're passionate about in an animal. Um, and you know, obviously there's a caveat to that. There are certain snakes that uh, come with certain things that make them a little bit more challenging. You know, maybe snakes that aren't super well established in captivity, uh, snakes that feed on tricky items, snakes that are rear fang venomous, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in terms of kind of the bigger pool of commonly kept animals, I think what makes it a good beginner snake is it being your favorite snake or reptile. Mm. Sorry. I end, I end up focusing on snakes, but reptile, because if it's your favorite and you're passionate about it, you're going to do the work and the research to actually do it right. I think that's a, a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous point is something that you're passionate about. Good, good, good. Riley, what do you think makes a good beginner snake? Beginner snake or beginner reptile? I said that. See, I do the same thing. <laughs> beginner reptile. Yeah, absolutely. I, mm. um, you know, I love snakes, but yeah, I, I, th I, I think it's something that one, you have to be genuinely interested in to something that is realistic for the space you can allocate for it. And, and three, something that fits your lifestyle. I think the biggest thing people don't realize is some reptiles can be high maintenance as far as their daily needs and requirements. And some reptiles can be very low maintenance in terms of what they need on a daily basis um and so to me the best beginner reptile is something that fits within a person's budget lifestyle household space and and what they're truly interested in trying to keep yeah that makes sense to me summer um Let's let's move on to you. What uh, what do you think makes? And I know you kind of hashed on this in your video, but what what makes a good beginner reptile? So everything that Lucas and Riley have already mentioned, I think definitely applies. Um, and and I would say uh, beyond just the kind of logistical aspect, I would say something kind of like what Lucas was getting into the passion, but something that their personality you know, however we want to phrase that for reptiles, but their personality matches you or what you're wanting, you know, like if, if you, if you want to see it, if you want a snake, that's going to be sitting out like a display animal, then that's a totally different animal than like I, Lori was talking about her rainbow boas the other day that she never sees. Um, so it just depends on really what you're after and not just finding a snake that fits your budget, your lifestyle, your space, your, your time, but that is going to be interesting to you because you can look at a pretty snake all day on the, you know, on the internet or in videos or at a pet shop, but then you get it home. And if it doesn't do the things that you want it to do, it might not be a really great experience. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, let me, let me stay with you, Summer, and ask you, do top five lists 
it suck? Oh, I muted you. Let me let me throw you back on there again. Um, because it because you 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 made the video and you didn't do a top five list. So what do you got against them? Do you hate YouTubers? <laughs> no, I don't hate YouTubers, but I do I do hate in a way. Hate's a strong word, but I also think there's this kind of weird ethical thing about labeling these certain animals as beginners that puts them in the position to be more frequent frequently um neglected and mistreated because they're perceived as easy and beginner mm -hmm. and like, oh you don't really need to do anything at all to have these um and so then people get them home and they don't pay attention to them and they stick them in a box under their bed and they they change their water once a month you know like i just feel like that also can have implications beyond maybe the intended implication of just advising people on what are good pets, but um, it creates this culture of these animals that are kind of seen as throwaway when, mm. as you mentioned, they live for like 40 years. So that's insane. Yeah. Especially if you're talking about a, a, a desert tortoise or something, you know, that someone picks up and um, it lives 65 years and you, they're going to get rid of it. They're probably just going to let it go if they're not ready to keep it. Um, well, I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in if, if top five lists suck. <laughs> I think we'll move on. Uh, it, unless someone feels strongly. Uh, so in summer, let's stay right with you because you're on a roll. Of all the beginner reptiles, which is the worst? Sorry, I have a habit of muting myself because on other Zoom calls, I usually have to mute myself when I'm not. Oh, talking. yeah. Um, you're just keeping me on my on my finger toes. Of all the beginner reptiles, which is the worst? Uh huh. I mean, okay, I'll say bearded dragon. Um, Ooh, why? Just because I think they require the most. Uh, kind of like what Riley was saying. That's an animal that you have to do a lot of daily maintenance for, and the set like, I mean, we this is a whole other discussion, but providing the bare minimum for them to just be healthy not necessarily enriched or like mentally stimulated or anything, but just so that they don't like get diseases and shrivel up and get weird and deformed um, is more than say a crested gecko or something like that. So if you aren't providing the proper enclosure and stuff, you're going to really see the issues with that animal. And you've also got to feed them daily, multiple times a day, lots of bugs, lots of greens, the whole UVB, the whole shebang. Um, I just think that they're a lot more work than a lot of people realize. I think that's a, that's a great answer. I was just, um, uh, you did it again. I was just thinking, uh, yeah, that wasn't even what I was thinking of. And then as soon as you said, I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. Like if, if I got one now, I would treat it so differently than I would have 15 years ago. Good answer. Uh, Riley, what, oh, sorry, Summer, someone else? I was just going to say that I have a bearded dragon that I got when I was 11, when I was in my crazy reptile acquiring phase. Um, I still have her. As she's how old am I? She's seven, 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. She's really old. Um, and yeah, had I known then what I would learn, I don't know if I would have dived into something like that because it's not doesn't really fit my personality. Yeah, good point. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Riley, what uh, what about you? What, of all the beginning reptiles, which is the worst? <sighs> Green iguana. Oh, sure. Yeah. And for, for those who don't know why, tell us why. Uh, they will get big enough to actually hurt you, um, especially in the breeding season, the middle of summer. An adult male will, you know, he can reach over seven feet long and with the head and, and jaw uh, gape of his size and the power and the tail whip, he can really hurt you. And I've experienced that. Um, and, you know, I grew up seeing them for sale in Petco's and other chain shops for 30 bucks, 40 bucks or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and being in the retail outfit now, people constantly ask where are iguanas? And I, and I was like, well, we don't carry those because that's not a very easy animal for most people to keep. And they're like, what do you mean? They're, they're at all these other, and I'm like, yeah, that thing's going to get bigger than you. And they're like, what? And they mm -hmm. like they they never and most people are like yeah i had one for a year and it died and it's because nobody knows how to keep them because peco gives them some cheese grater cookie cutter little 
you know, hey, oh, keep it in this little box and it'll be fine. And and everybody thinks they're like some mythical fish that only gets as big as this <laughs> magic box that you've put it in. And and they're just monsters um, because that's what they are. They're just like big lizards that need a lot of space and they have a lot of testosterone and, and a lot of social behaviors and needs. And nobody tells you that at, you know, Petco. And so to me, that's kind of the stereotypical Petco beginner reptile that everybody tries to farm out for cheap. And it's like the worst possible animal for somebody to get into reptiles with if they're not prepared to take care of a big lizard. And I'll, I'll add to that too, because yeah, their teeth are formidable. Their tail whip is gnarly, but I've even had extremely docile, well-behaved females, which mm -hmm. aren't as big and are usually a little bit nicer mm -hmm. and their claws, they're designed to hold on to the tree. And so they yeah. have these long sh razor sharp nails. So just even a docile one, when you're holding it, um, you will bleed. Yeah. you will bleed um it's it's not unlike a cat scratching you except it's it's just trying to move on you it's um, worse i would argue it's way worse just because of their size and everything just yeah. them moving i can't tell you how many days i leave the shop scratched up and bloody just from working with a monitor in a positive way yeah, yeah in a very positive way and it, it's i don't know it's it's fun when you do it and it, it to to the weirdos who are into reptiles you're like yeah look at my I'm working with the monitor today <laughs> but like if you're not expecting that um yeah you're 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 gonna hate that really nice animal doing its normal normal life good answer mm -hmm. green iguana is a uh, it's a terrible beginner reptile uh what do you think lucas yeah, I, I was actually also going to say green iguana. I think Riley hit the nail on the head. They are mm -hmm. way too easily available for what they are <laughs> and and not uh, the information provided at like a Petco is insufficient for what the reality of owning that animal is going to be. Um, so with that being said, I guess I, I would just say that of all the beginning reptiles, maybe interpreting it in a different way. Not, it's not the worst because of the animal, but what I see having the worst outcome because of the situation mm. those animals are put in, I would have to say ball pythons, um, just in that, in the short period of time that I worked at, at the vivarium, the amount of ball python surrenders, if you will, was just unbelievable like i would usually be first one there and sometimes there would just be boxes at the gate you know and mm -hmm. like it, it's it's to such an extent that you know the management at the vivarium charges people money to take the ball pythons because they don't expect to be able to sell them it's like that it, it's that level of how many of these snakes are being bought by people that don't have the right information are just being fed a cookie cutter answer of this is the best first snake for you and then are unhappy and dump them wherever they can you know I, I think that in terms of what is the worst beginning reptile situation uh, I'd say just the tragic amount of of ball python uh, surrenders I suppose yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it's a good one. And I would say I'm noticing a trend here. Those are all three really affordable pet reptiles at the big box stores. And I think what a lot of people don't pick up on, um, sometimes they think, oh, cheap and easy, right? That means it's, it must be plentiful and abundant for a good reason. Sometimes it's just cheap. Like you get a Savannah monitor for real cheap too. And they're really difficult to keep properly for it to give them a long, healthy life. Because, um, uh, you know, they eat a diet of an insane amount of bugs. Um, and I don't think what a lot of people realize is that the reason why the cost is so low is it comes in from, it, it's because the import fees are so cheap. You know, they're just imported by the thousands and, or, or they're bred in such ridiculously high numbers that there's just no demand. Like there's, you could get any kind of ball python you want just about from, from the right breeder, um, especially if you're talking about the, the, the less rare morphs. And there's, like Riley, you touched on earlier, there's hundreds and hundreds of morphs. So um, you can get that stuff real easy. And, and I think people mistake easy to get with easy to care for. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, uh, I'm glad we're talking about that. Now, let's, um, 
let's stay on that topic because I, you know, I'd always ask what someone should do before buying a reptile. And I think that's hopefully this is one of the videos they're watching. Maybe they're watching summer's video. There's also a video with animals at home podcast, which, uh, one of our, our, um, viewers tonight hi Lori was on the panel um and she they she was on the panel uh, they, they did a group discussion and they really dove into depth if you're thinking about getting a pet reptile I'll put a link to that in our YouTube when I post it um about what you should do before that before you actually get a reptile and things to consider um but I'm gonna ask a, another question too uh I realize most people go into a chain store um pick up a baby corn snake or ball python or chameleon or Chinese water dragon, uh, spend $200 on gear that they sell at the store, um, get a little brochure, the, the care guide um, and, and go home. So what should someone do immediately after doing that? Uh, Riley, we'll start with you. Oh, uh, <laughs> immediately after getting- The iguana from the little Petco kit and in getting... the 20 gallon tank. Uh, in today's world, with everybody having access to the internet, what I would do is I would search around online and see if you can find somebody locally to you that works with either that species or something similar in some capacity and ask if you can go learn from them, go see their setups, go see how they manage their animals, go see what they've learned and, and try and learn from other people's mistakes even if you've already just made one <laughs> <laughs> so well said <laughs> yeah excellent like right find a mentor um yeah and, and i think you'd be surprised how easy it is to talk to someone um that you, you haven't met. you meet someone on facebook and you say they have hey and just be respectful you know like what's up i need help and then like, uh, no, I had a long day at work. I don't know this person, but you know, introduce yourself, right? Um, this is like human interaction 101 stuff. Say hi, mm -hmm. tell them you have a mutual interest uh, yeah. and, uh, and ask them for guidance. And, but like, seriously, folks, I can't tell you how many experts I've spoken with who I was just like, wow, thank you so much for sending like Lori Trini, the, the, the panel member, that's just the easiest person to talk to. If you want to talk about reptile behavior, look her up on YouTube, look her up on Facebook and messenger. And I'm throwing you out there, Lori, she'll respond to you and she'll be real nice about it too. Um, and she'll answer your <laughs> questions if you're nice to her first, um, like all humans. Cause that's, that's the, the minimum that people deserve. Um, anyways, I don't know where I'm going. I'm off on a tangent. Excellent point, Riley, get a mentor. Uh, Lucas, what would you yeah. say? Uh, so I, I just bought a, a ball python and it's in a, um, you know, a 10 gallon fish tank with a, a heat pad. What, what do I do next? I think what a lot of people and invariably do end up doing next uh, in that particular instance is they try to feed it two, after, two hours after they got home <laughs> and, then they, and then they panic and then they call the store where they got it from uh, and you get, you know, uh, angry uh, salespeople at the store. They're like, we told you to not touch it for two weeks and, you know, lived experience here. But then another, <laughs> another thing that a lot of people do when they find themselves in that situation is they go straight to the major Facebook group, right? So they'll look up ball pythons USA and then they'll post like, just got this. What do I do? And they're, <laughs> met, they're met by either if they're lucky silence or if they're not, outrage and like yes. what are you doing you know clearly you weren't prepared how dare you buy an animal that you weren't ready for and they just get berated and uh you know ridiculed and shot down and boy isn't that a great way to dip your your feet into your right you know, the pool of of herpetoculture and i you know we see it pretty much every day and so daily those, without a doubt yeah yeah so so with that being said i think what would be a lot better to do and this kind of takes a little bit of uh, action and maturity, I guess, on the person that purchased the animal would be to research these things as much as they can with resources that are already available, you know, because there are a lot of resources that are already available. It can be hard to come through it and figure out what's right and what's good. Um, that can be a challenge for sure. And that's where I feel like what Riley's saying with you know, finding somebody that you can talk to 
um, you know, get on the phone if you can. It's so much better to talk to somebody over the phone than through text on social media. Mm-hmm. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's just always better. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that trying to do as much of the self-educating as you can um, once kind of the excitement fades and you realize what you have. And hopefully at that point, you you want to figure out how to do it well. Um, and uh, if, if you can't find the answers you're looking for, then that might be the best time to reach out to people with a specific question. And hopefully you're less likely to get flamed for it at that point. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so I think we're coming, we're, we tend to come around that too, is just reach out individually. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's that's terrific advice. Summer, what would you say? I was going to say to kind of combine Riley and Lucas's approach. I personally do this if I, like for instance, at work right now, we have a a Black Dragon monitor and I really don't know anything about monitors, but I like it and I'm trying to help give it a good life, um, learning as I go because I didn't purchase the animal, but I kind of have to work with it now. So what I've done is joined monitor groups and I don't post anything, I just read. I read stuff and then Mm -hmm. through reading the groups, I have seen certain people that keep posting and seem to have a number of the animals, their cages look nice. And so if I've had a specific question, I've just messaged those people directly and said, hey, I saw you on the monitor group, you know, a little backstory, you know, a couple sentences about, I I haven't worked, whatever. And then ask a specific question. And that is met with much, much, more sympathy and empathy and um, care than I think just immediately going on and asking 7,000 questions on a group to general people who most of, honestly, a lot of those people shouldn't be giving you advice anyway. So (laughs) you kind of have to curate who you're asking advice from. Um, In addition to using every resource you can, YouTube, Google, scientific journals, books you can find, go to the library. That's a thing I think still. You know, there's, there's tons of information out there to be found, but at some point you have to take it on yourself to find it. And if I, I think that's kind of where a lot of people fall short yeah. is kind of are content to not. Yeah. I think, um, I think to be a good reptile keeper, there's a number of things you have to learn how to perfect. Um, some people need to, to learn how to keep bugs if they want to keep reptiles. Um, others needed to learn how to keep plants. I think the most crucial skill and, um, you know, some, uh, something that the previous generation was like, duh, obviously, um, but uh, younger folks don't necessarily take it, realize is just reading. Um, I have in my hand the most instant gratification tool that's ever been invented and we don't read. So I can't tell you how many times someone asks a question on a forum and then the very Hours later, someone else asked the exact same, like kind of boneheaded question. And it's like, dude, if you'd have spent two minutes scrolling up on your phone, but like people don't want to do that. They want it now, they want it right away. But it's not just on Facebook. It's not just on forums. Um, Everywhere. It's a book. Order a book from Amazon. Some of them, guys, you're not going to believe this. Some of the books you need aren't even on Amazon. Uh, You're going to have to like go to some reptile guy's private website that like looks like it was built in 2001 (laughs) because it was and order a book on, on breeding whatever pair of snakes that you're interested in keeping. And it's like, dig around, look for it, look it up, um, read and, and read the, the, I can't tell you how many times just listening to other people's questions get answered. I've, I've learned so much. Um, Tara asked the question that we were talking about, how much of the typical Petco slash PetSmart stuff do you think is actually the best or at least good quality to use for reptile care? Do you buy anything from these stores for your reptiles or do you have better sources for all of your reptile needs? Any examples? Um, Danielle weighed in on that. She said Petco has Exoterra tanks, which are good for a variety of species and also for quarantine. Starter and interim tank for babies and adolescents. And some, some species are, are good size for them too. So yeah, so like, right, I'll answer that. Fish tanks, or, I said fish tanks, uh, uh, reptile tanks are good um, at there. And same with fish tanks, you know, if you want a 15 gallon, like for, you know, fish, go to, uh, to a big box store, they're easy to get. Um, 
as for any of the like substrate stuff, I go to garden centers. Um, all that stuff is a third the price. Um, if I'm getting a bunch of cork bark, I get that from a distributor. But a lot of the stuff there is it's fine. Um, to be honest with you, I think it's the stuff that comes in a starter kit that is is a problem when they say, oh, you need this light and this light. It's like, no, like half the stuff on the shelf, you don't need red lights. Reptiles see it just like we do. And if you're using it at nighttime, it's going to be annoying. If you're using the blue lights at, not lights at nighttime, it's even worse. Um, but yeah, what do you guys think? Was there any stuff you guys actually pick up from Petco or PetSmart? Um, there's one brand of plants and I can't remember which it maybe it's exoterra I want to say but they have like a pretty decent like natural line of plants that are based on actual plants and they tell you what plant it's supposed to be um and I do like I have a couple of those just for fun for me because I feel like they look pretty good but other than that um I don't really buy things and it's really, it's not because it's the quality really. It's just that it's, it's overpriced. Right. Well, I say overpriced, but it's more than I would am often willing to pay when the same function can be provided by, you know, like spending $30 on a hide when I could spend $6 on the same size hide provides the same function for the snake. I'm not really going to spend that expense. Um, but that's just me. What about you guys? There's definitely been instances where I've been in a pinch um, and I was at the time closer to a Petco than I was to like a dedicated reptile shop. And for, for things like uh, ceramic heat, em heat emitter bulbs, mm -hmm. um, you know, they might be a little bit more expensive at, at the, the Petco, for example, but like, if you need heat, you need heat, you know, and you're going to find the same brand there, at least in my case that I would at my reptile shop. Um, I, you know, I don't think the Petco near me even has rodent feeders anymore. Mm. So, no. Most most <laughs> Petco chains won't do that anymore. Yeah, they used to, and in a pinch, yeah. you know, that that was an option. But They'll yeah, have the not frozen anymore. Ones. Oh yeah. yeah, they'll do frozen. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. They'll do frozen. Um, they won't do live. The one thing that I think that Petco and and the likes like to kind of throw in with your your starter set that is not super great are the dial thermometers and the dial, mm. uh, um, humidity gauges. Uh, they're pretty not accurate. And <laughs> at least in my opinion, most of the time you want to know your temperature where the snake is not right. on the side of the wall, halfway up the enclosure, right. you know? So that's one of those ones that I think we need to, to kind of thank and make go away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did, uh, what about you, Riley? Anything else you want to add? Anything yeah. You no. Pick up from there. The well, I mean, the only thing I would say is I don't shop at any of those chains personally because I manage a, a specialty shop. True. So, so one, I can get it at my shop, and two, I you know get the employee discount. <laughs> um, but uh, no, the, the here's a little secret that's not a secret. Um, all those big chains, Petco, PetSmart, Pet Supplies Plus, everybody else. They all order from the same parent mm -hmm. companies that all the specialty shops like ours do. They just get kind of a blanket statement bulk group of products and they just buy individually for their stores. They don't do big bulk like we do. We'll stock up on tanks and bedding and stuff for months. And so what that means is they just get a rate going price, whatever the, the corporate big parent company, you know, buys their stuff for and corporate tells the shops what to list their prices at. Whereas we have to strategically purchase in order to keep our costs down so we can still give folks the good price breaks. So it's the same exact products. It's yeah. just, if you go to a specialty store, if you happen to be fortunate enough to live uh, in close proximity to one, assuming they're nice and don't jack up the prices because they're the only specialty store in the area, you can get good quality stuff at a little bit of a price break um, that the big box stores would carry. And you might also get somebody behind the counter with a little more knowledge who can help you with what you're looking for. So it's not that the products themselves I wouldn't buy, it's the venue mm. they're being sold at. Uh, if I didn't have my perspective of a manager uh, at a shop and didn't have that access, 
uh, but I still had a, a, a specialty shop. I would go to the, for, to the specialty shop for as much as humanly possible, just um, for the knowledge and, and the supporting the local specialty more than the corporate just because the products are the same, you're just going to get a different answer and a different price break at a corporation. I think that's a huge point. Um, support small businesses. I mean, not, I don't know if that's a, a political statement or not, but I think it's a great statement <laughs> is, is support small businesses, support the, the local guy. Like that's someone who goes home. You know what I mean? Like the, the big box stores, they're fine. They're going to be fine. People, you know, they, they sell dog food and cat food. They're good. Uh, but like someone went through the effort of saying, I love reptiles and fish and birds, and I'm going to make a store that sells just stuff for that. Go there, like support those people, <laughs> keep them in business, let them feed their kids. <laughs> and cause it's, it's, I mean, Riley, you see the back end of it. It's mm -hmm. tight. Like I, and we, we worked at, um, I, I think all of us have worked at pet stores it or companies that support that and it's it can be tight <laughs> you know like i was like yeah. thankfully i didn't own it like i considered it and then after working at one i was like oh i don't think i want to do that because i want to you know have a paycheck um so like be the guy that goes there be the be the girl that gets their first pet at um at the exotic store where you talk to someone who's like oh well when i spoke to the breeder he told me this and this and this about these animals and they came from this and they need mm -hmm. this and this is exactly what you need instead of this try this you know blah 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 right um and i can't tell you how many plus they're cool places to hang out like uh for, for those that are watching this, you'll probably enjoy hanging out at those uh, at those stores more than you will like the, the big box stores where you're gonna get someone's like, oh yeah, um, I'm into the fish, but I can help you pick out a chameleon if you want. You know, it's gonna be just a different conversation. So go bug your local uh, your local exotic store, if you have one, that's the thing too. There's, they're not everywhere, but mm -hmm. right. yeah, great point. Um, yeah, and, and good question, Tara. There, there's definitely stuff there. I'll, I'll swing by in a pinch because there's three big box stores within four miles of my house and the nearest exotics is 25 minutes that I support. So um, it's it's a big difference. Um, yeah, summer, you pick up crickets um, and every now and then I pick up a, a feeder if I don't have the right size hopper or something like that. Um, right, uh, let's say Lucas, we'll, we'll go up to you. If your friend told you that you could get only one reptile they have absolutely zero knowledge whatsoever of reptiles other than maybe what they've seen on the crocodile hunter reruns what species would you tell them to get and how would you help them give it the best care so this is this is diving into popular youtube category of what's the best pet <laughs> pet reptile for you but what right. would you say to the, so my, to the complete newbie my complete newbie friend is getting the reptile yeah okay um yeah i well i in an ideal world right i would talk to said newbie friend for a while and pick their brain try to get a feel for what they're looking for in an animal before i make that call um but if it's purely a reflection of me and what i think the best mm -hmm. snake is uh for a beginner i i am a huge fan of uh the brettles python um Morelia bredley um i think that they tick all of my boxes in that they are almost always very docile and placid by nature. And probably fair to say the majority of people are looking for snakes that aren't going to bite them. Um, of course, there's the subset that are looking for that. But, you know, uh, more often than not, that's, that's a plus. Uh, I think they're beautiful. Um, they are one of the most temperature tolerant species that you can keep in captivity if you make a mistake you're almost certainly not going to lose the life of your animal because of it, which means you get a second chance when you learn from that mistake, which is great. Um, they eat like crazy. Uh, they're always out and visible. They're super active. So yeah, that, that, that would be my recommendation. And I would also feel comfortable recommending that because I have a good number of them that I've cared for successfully for a long enough time now where I feel like I could help if, if that friend needed it down the road. So you heard it, folks. If you need help with your bread light python, <laughs> just reach out to Lucas. He's got you covered. Um, thank you. That, yeah, that's good. What What about you, Summer? What do you think? If you had to recommend one animal. So I also have um, Bradley, bread light, brettles, <laughs> um, uh, and I I do think they are a great snake, but I don't know that I would recommend them to beginners uh, because 
mine are not as nice as I think yours appear to be. <laughs> <laughs> Neither are Riley's. What's going on? <laughs> By any means, but they are Ludicrous. a little bit more. Um, they're just a little bit more reactive in my experience. Mm. Than I think some other snakes are, and, mm. and it's not a bad thing. They're not, <laughs> minor, minor, they don't strike or anything like that, but I can see how if somebody were to not really know what they were doing, they might rub the snake the wrong way. And that could, um, you know, cause like I have one that I kind of, I have to approach it a certain way to have mm. interactions with it. And I think somebody that's not as discerning would maybe the snake would not fare well in their care. Sure. Um, yeah. Oh, but they are awesome and I love them and they're a wonderful snake, beautiful, just amazing. But I would say uh super door free tick. Um kind of pricey, but for out of my experience of the animals that I've I currently have, and I have a pretty small sample size, but mine is the, the most um personable snake. So he does not um he doesn't really care what I do to him in the sense of he's not super reactive if I come at him from the wrong angle. In fact, he often is really um, aimed at me, in a, not in a, not in a like focused on me to bite me away, but like he, he tends to gravitate toward me as opposed to away from me, which is a kind of unique thing. Most snakes don't do that. Um, and also they're just, I mean, it's a python. They're a, it's a standard python care kind of thing you know once you know how to take care of the pythons most of them kind of fall into a category where it's pretty pretty similar so it's nothing too complicated care wise um they don't a male will not get huge they are um great eaters so it, to me it's it's basically all the things that lucas mentioned about the bread lie i just think that they have a slightly better temperament more um a amiable friendly almost but yeah, but yeah, basically the same reasons Lucas said, but I just think their temperaments are a little bit more suited for people who aren't really into snakes as much. And so how would you tell a, how would you tell a friend like the best way, like, look, here's what you're going to, here's how you're going to become an expert keeper. What would you, what would you recommend they do? Cause they watch, don't know anything. Watch what? the animal a lot. Watch what? Watch the animal a lot. Okay. Just, you know, I mean, obviously if I'm telling them what to do, I'll get it all set up right. Um, and tell them the, you know, what you have to do to keep it alive, but to really have be successful, I think it really comes down to paying attention to the animal and starting to pick up on their behaviors and their body language and understanding what different things that they do mean. And really you can't, um, you can't put that in a care sheet really mm -hmm. so something that really, you just have to kind of live and learn. Um, but you're, if you're, if you're actively trying to do that, you're going to learn it a lot faster than if you are just totally clueless, spaced out, not paying attention to things. Um, so yeah, so I'm just telling them to really key into what the animal does. That's smart. Um, and, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, the big store, uh, the, the cheap pets being the beginner pets. Uh, in this case, the Super Dwarf Free Tech is probably not the, the easiest to afford a uh, beginner pet, but uh, look, reptiles are expensive. And I think that's another thing um, we should realize is look, it's going to be expensive. Uh, you can get a thermostat for $19, no problem. It might not last you more than three months and then it might fail and your heat element goes up 400% and kill the animal that you're trying to keep. Um, or you could pay $200 for a thermostat that does a great job and lasts forever. And if it fails, it, it shuts off, right? So um, I, I don't think you have to recommend it an inexpensive animal to be a first reptile because look, this is something that's going to last a long time. And if you have to save up a little while to get a $1,400 animal, um, maybe consider it. And then Lori, and then Riley, I'll get to you too, but Lori had some great points since we were talking about the bread lies. So we have some here that were surrendered for chronic biting and what their humans perceived mm -hmm. as behavior issues. I do not have any issues with them here and they are my favorite snake. I'm talking about bread lie. And then, I, and then she, Lori added, our, our super dwarf SD retic is our friendliest snake as far as pet temperament. What were we going to say, Lucas? I do. Yeah. I just really want to want to highlight kind of the differences that Summer notices in her Bread lie, bread lead. dang it, see, me too. Um, compared bread to mine, lead. compared to what Riley's told me, which I know he, he can touch on it, but they're a little bit more cantankerous. 
I think that that's such an important point for people to realize is that we can't generalize across mm -hmm. the species. They are individuals. And I can recommend all day the snake that is supposed to be a certain way, but that doesn't make it true. You know, they are 100% individuals. There's going to be exceptions to every rule. There's going to be snakes that are supposed to be the nastiest animal that are going to be puppy dog tame and vice versa. And that's just a really important point that I didn't want to pass up. Good. And I think um, when it comes to their personalities, uh, I'd be remiss in, again, not mentioning uh, Lori Trini's Facebook, uh, or excuse me, her YouTube channel and, and seeing how the work she does with the with the training too and reptile enrichment training. Uh, just fantastic groups to be part of because just like we've, everyone knows that if you train a dog to sit and to stay and to lay down um, and to come and to go to your bed and, you know, all those things, that it's less likely to freak out and just be a, a, a psycho biting machine, right? Like it training matters in terms of personalities and it's really proving to be no different with, with reptiles too, which is, it's awesome to see all that stuff happening in terms of their behavior. Riley, what would you say to a, to a brand new, um, uh, uh, someone, hey, Riley, I want to get a new snake or a new reptile. What, what should I get? I mean, if we're talking snake, that's that's easier to, to narrow in. If we're talking general reptile, I would honestly still gravitate towards snake because of how easy most of the care and time allotment required for an individual is. I think that's why I keep accidentally saying snake, because to my mind, that's a beginner reptile, but that's, that's my own bias, so I'm sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, I, with yours. I, I really couldn't recommend a lizard over a handful of species of snakes in my mind even the lowest maintenance lizard say like a crested gecko i've seen people become very overwhelmed surrender surrender them not want them like they're too hoppy or you know whatever just little things uh or they want to interact differently with them or they're worried about the tail dropping so i still think a snake is probably the best way to ease into reptile keeping because of their low maintenance, even if, you know, mom and dad are going to be a little squeamish about it. You know, if you're a diligent, you know, enthusiastic young kid or somebody's trying to get into it or whatever, just, you know, you can, you could find a way to convince them, be educational about it, but something like um, uh, a captive born and bred pop wind carpet or a corn snake that is well established those those are kind of like my neck and neck and and the reason why i can't pick one over the other is because i've experienced some of the challenges with, with corn snakes only wanting live food which can be a turnoff for people or going to the bathroom a lot which can be a turnoff for people but they're very hardy and their ease of care is fantastic and they're a wonderful pet snake very gentle docile handleable interactive demeanor the carpet python the reason why that isn't uh just a front runner uh, pop winds tend to like a little more humidity which seems to throw people for a loop and they are still a carpet python with a feeding response at times and uh for a beginner sometimes that can be overwhelming um so those two little like asterisks for each species are kind of why i can't like pick just one or the other but i don't know yeah it's either it's either a pop wind carpet that already has a good demeanor or uh, a yearling corn snake. Yeah. And so I, I noticed that for, for each of you guys, um, you're not, I mean, a, cor a yearling corn snake, you could probably find, that's probably the only one you could find at a, at a big box pet store. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you, you can find the others at a local dealer. Um, but for these, these are something that you're going to have to find someone. You're going to have mm -hmm. to at least private mass. Maybe you get one on morph market. Um, and you, you know, it's, it's, it's as, point and click it and click an order as you can get. But um, ideally, like you might have to meet someone on, on a forum or on Facebook and message them and, you know, deal with someone directly. So uh, to get a good animal, that's, that's kind of the trend now. Like it, it, there, there definitely is the big stores, but for the most part, you're, you're talking to someone directly about the animal. Um, good answers. How, Riley, we'll stay with you. How can you tell when you're give, when uh, it, when you're looking at advice? We talked about reading. How can you tell the good advice from the bad? Uh, the good advice has anecdotal personal experiences to validate 
certain statements or claims to me. Um, I, I spend a lot of time digging around online when I'm putting together videos or, you know, working on stuff for the shop or when I was at the zoo helping out with the education program and stuff. And you'd be surprised how much is just copied and pasted across a lot of mm -hmm. these sites. And it usually, you can usually just spend 20 minutes and find the first site that posted it and find the exact sentences copied and pasted all over these other sites. Right. And, um, so those ones, they're not necessarily bad, but they're usually lacking some sort of like that, that extra personal touch that is the difference between reading a book and having somebody tell you something. Um, there's just a personal element when you're reading, a reading some advice or getting some advice that makes all the difference. And it kind of adds a little bit more validation to what you're hearing in my opinion yeah okay that's good advice yeah someone's being specific right mm -hmm. um and and not just uh giving you hard fast rules mm -hmm. um that's another one and i think we could talk about because i i uh, you said it on, on the panel and i've seen it on your youtube so there's a, and it's something i've discussed on my facebook it, there's so many hard and true always never break this rule reptile rules until you know what you're doing and then of course break them all the time you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so it's like you, you want to you need to hear someone's personal experience when they talk about that um good point uh summer uh what about you how can you tell good advice from bad so i was gonna mention the same thing um two things come to mind really one is so good advice to me has context so if I'm, if I'm, somebody's telling me something, well, why? So, uh, they need a basking temperature of 90 degrees. Okay. Why? Because in their native habitat, they're often found basking on rocks at temperatures of this. Okay, cool. I get it now. If it's, if you're just telling me this is how it is, these absolute, like kind of like you mentioned, these absolutes with no context, mm -hmm. to me, that isn't really going to give me the confidence that um, it's reliable information. So I want to know why you're telling me this is the case. Um, and, and kind of back to uh, Riley's point, that can be a personal anecdote um, or scientific evidence based stuff from journals or research studies, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so advice without context, that's where I think we get into that, like, and I feel like this term is becoming overused, but husbandry folklore, you know, where you're, mm -hmm. it's just being repeated. Everybody hears it and then they repeat it, but nobody knows why everybody thinks that. Um, and so I think to step away from that, you have to really look at the why. Why is this being told to me and where is it coming from? I think that's a great point. Uh, yeah, why? Uh, find out just the why. Don't just take everything at face value because if someone says, um, you know, your king snake needs to have 100 degrees and uh and like well that's what it is outside like wait think let someone you know because 100 degrees is pretty bad actually for a snake that lives in 100 degree weather um and if we get the why they need lower it's that's good that becomes goes from bad advice to good advice uh lucas what about you what would you say mm -hmm. uh, you look for i i agree with all that's been said and and it is it is way harder than it should be to find the good advice in the sea of uh, as, as Dr. Lofen puts it, the husbandry dogma, right? The folklore husbandry, it's, mm -hmm. which is so pervasive. Um, and I, I don't know that I have really a good answer on how to get through that because I feel like I definitely fell victim to, uh, to that when I was new because it's, it's what's easily, uh, excuse me, it's what is most easily available. And, um, you know, if you, are researching and trying to do well uh, by your animals, you're still going to run into bad advice. And I guess all that to say, I feel very fortunate uh, that I feel like I found a really good group of folks that mm -hmm. kind of come at husbandry from a natural history perspective and use um, natural history to guide what they are doing. And like Summer said, have a reason as to the why with these kinds of things, um, but but then again, that just comes to comes down to whether you trust your source or not, and and what you know. Even then, it's you know I, I love how 
Eric on Morelia Python Radio always describes it. It's not like baking a cake. Taking care of an animal is not like baking a cake. You can have good advice that's good advice for somebody in Florida, and maybe it's terrible advice for somebody in California. You know, So even to that extent, you have to vet everything and apply it to your situation. So uh, it, it does certainly get tricky. And I don't know that I've cracked that code. That is a great analogy because it's not baking. Um, it, it, baking is like it's the same. It's it's here in, you know, if it's in California or London, it's going to be um, a recipe is a recipe. But um, keeping a, a breadly, um, that's another beginning <laughs> thing that you should learn is learn how to speak Latin, apparently. Um, uh, but, you know, keeping that properly, is, it's going to be different for so many people. And on top of it, who knows? Even the experts are like, hey, I do something different now than I did last year and it's mm -hmm. so much better. And I can't believe I did that terrible thing that I told 2000 people to do, you know, like it, yeah. we're all learning. Yeah. It's both uh, one of the most like fascinating and frustrating parts of keeping these animals is mm -hmm. that it is an evolving science. We don't know everything yet, yeah. right? Which that grabs you because you can actually be on the forefront of something, but you also have to know that those answers are not set in stone and may, might not even be known. <laughs> That's a great point. Um, Lori had her, her super dope retake out on, on screen. Um, and I'm sorry, it's not re recording on, on YouTube for, for the, because <laughs> uh, it's it's so cool. Yeah, she's always got them out enriching. And she wrote a, her super dope retake is trying to get to that stand behind her. But Ronan, her bread loose python is already using it. And it's mainly his stand. So I'm not making a move. Uh, I, I love it. And it, it, it's, it's, once you get to know your, that's I think the most fascinating thing about keeping reptiles is getting to know their personalities. Um, I have a, a female rainbow boa that I can't, I, I simply can't touch. Uh, well, I can handle it. She, she's fine with being handling. She's not afraid of anything. She loves the way I taste and will eat any flesh that she sees. So like I have gloves and the, otherwise she just stays on. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not a scary thing. So I want to talk about that. Like, um, just we'll go through it real quick. Lucas, we'll start with you and then we'll move on. Um, how many times have you been bit by a reptile or a snake? And what's that about? What do you feel about <laughs> it? Because that, 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 that is, a, <laughs> I think that's like the first question that a lot of people ask, like, oh, I think about getting a snake. They're so cool. They're really pretty. I want one, but I don't want to get bit. Right. What do you say? So to answer the question between, you know, work in the field, work in a pet shop and working with animals at home. I've, I've been bitten a lot, uh, mostly at the shop because for whatever reason, it seems to me like animals that are at an exotic pet shop are the ones that were nasty, which is why they're there and not in somebody's nice home. So <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot of them were pretty bitey. Um, what's that all about? Well, if, if the question is, I'm sorry. What what really are we? What are we looking for with this? What do one? you? What do you? What would you say to someone who's uh, like, "Hey, look, this is. Uh, uh, I want to get a snake. Okay, I'm afraid of getting bit. So okay, like, what would you tell them? I was in the same boat um, when I was first getting into snakes um, visually and in terms of natural history. The snake that fascinated me the most was a woma python, and I did not go with that, even though it was the snake I was most passionate about, because when I went to a pet shop and took one out to see what it was all about, bit the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and what I will say is that now, in hindsight, uh, Woma pythons are still what fascinates me. They're still one of my favorites. And now I have multiple of them. And I just quite simply don't care anymore when they bite me. <laughs> Uh, and I think that that's going to be <laughs> specific to the individual, whether that bothers you, whether it's something you get over or you don't. Um, but for me now, um, if it's something that's smaller than a, you know, seven foot Brettles Python, it's not really going to do much except bleed a bit. I don't want to get bit by my false water cobras, but outside of that, I, I really don't mind. <laughs> is the answer <laughs> yeah anyone anyone else want to weigh in on, on bites oh I, yeah go for it okay well so i actually went a really long time without getting bit wow and, um like i said i i got reptiles when i was 11. i mean i had them as a child but like i got my own reptiles when i was 11. and 
I did not get bit by one of my animals until I was 24. 24. Um, so I went a long time without getting bit. And I wasn't necessarily scared to get bit, but it's definitely true that it's way more like built up in your mind when when you haven't been bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you realize, okay, it really doesn't hurt that bad. So if somebody, to answer the question, if somebody was worried about, do they bite? Um, well, number one, yes, they can. So can a dog, so can a cat. And really a cat or a dog bite is most likely going to be worse. Way worse. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a 12 foot anaconda or something, you know? Um, so yes, but it's really, I mean, when I say it's not a big deal, I mean, injury wise, it's not a big deal. I do think it's somewhat of a big deal in the sense that um, there are some animals that are just kind of neurotic, but most times animals bite for a reason. So I think you can avoid a lot of bites by changing the way that you approach the animal and really keying into their behavior and watching them. The most bites that I have ever gotten is at work when I was cleaning thousands of ball pythons. That was my whole job was to clean ball pythons one after the other. And um, when, when I was working quickly and having to quickly reach in, take out the tub, take out the snake, wash, put the snake back, in that situation, more prone to being bit because I wasn't giving myself the time to read the animal. You know what I mean? Um, and so that is where I've experienced the most bites. I've lived to tell the tale. I don't have any scars. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I think in my own personal collection, I still have only been bit a handful of times. Um, my king snake is a king snake and sometimes randomly decides things are food that are not food for no discernible reason, um, just out of the blue. So that's, a, that's her personality. Um, but then, um, keeper error a couple of times with me just, um, pushing the snake further than I should have or not paying attention really. So that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Good points. Riley, did you want to add it on to the topic? I get bit all the dang time. <laughs> <laughs> like literally all the time by everything possible. Leopard geckos, fish, uh, tarantulas, <laughs> I I've, I have more scars from lizard bites than snake bites. I've never been bit by anything uh, venomous. I, I consider myself a, a pretty steel trap safe uh, venomous keeper. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I got six stitches in my forearm uh, last year from a rhino iguana. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got scars from monkey tails. I've got scars from uh, water monitors and things like that. And I get bit all the time by snakes, but yet I'd take a snake bite any day over 99% of lizard bites. And mm. they're really not that bad. And, and when people come in to ask, you know, about it, if it comes up and they're sort of trepidatious about it, as far as getting their first pet snake goes, I tell them like, it's really, it's really no different than like scraping your knuckle on something. It's actually probably less uh, significant. So especially when you're talking about a smaller baby of some species that they're first getting into. Um, but then I, I kind of tell them, you know, a lot of it's in your head. A lot of the reaction mm. causes the pain and the fear and the, and the adrenaline and, and potentially making the damage worse, pulling away, even though that's sort of a human reaction. Uh, so I try to tell people like, look, it, it is possible. Everything with a mouth can bite, but it's really, it's a lot in your head and it's really, it's, it, it can, it only happens when we typically make mistakes and there are ways to avoid it. And here's some safe handling techniques. Here's what to look for when your snake is agitated. Here's some do's and don'ts. And with this species, you're probably not going to encounter it unless X, Y, or Z happens. And, and I kind of just tailor it that way, but it really isn't, it isn't that big of a deal to me, but I also have to remember that's from years of making mistakes and taking bites and breeding and hatching babies that love nothing more than to bite when you're trying to go through and determine their gender or cleaning or you know accidental feeding responses things like that so it's not it's not a big deal and i, I think that's everyone's mentioned uh the same thing too there's the, it's important to point out there's two different kinds of bites and mm -hmm. uh, there's a defensive bite which mm -hmm. is the one that everyone thinks is going to happen you know oh it's scared of me so i'm so it's biting me or it's 
what people call it aggression, which they just really don't have it in them. They're not going after you. They're defending themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second time is the food response. So like, uh, Tara, you were telling me about your grouch. My, my Rima Boa, she's, she's not a grouch. She's, she's a doll. She's, she's really sweet. She's gentle. She's not out. She's not like, get out of my face. Like I could touch her head and stuff like that. She just wants to eat me um she thinks i'm food and I, that's got to be a fault of my own maybe i, I need to uh, use more soap <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh she just wants to eat me uh yeah. and, and i've had king snakes that were the same way that they want to eat everything yeah. and that's because they're their top mm -hmm. predators i find um, most snakes have a, just it's a sort of an instinctual response and even when you get a food response half the time they let go before they're even wrapping you up because they've realized they made a mistake mm -hmm. um i got bit by uh our female bolens at the shop last week and oh. she's a couple of years old and it's very uncharacteristic of her um but we had just gotten a rodent shipment in and she was sleeping and i was cleaning and she just grabbed me and i i still have like the you know the shark bite sort of thing on my hand but like mm -hmm. it really wasn't that big of a deal but it just it just happens you know mm -hmm. and, and i think that's an easy mistake to make too is like look just don't handle food but even if it's in the air like mm -hmm. i don't think people realize how just incredible their olfactory senses it's it's mm -hmm. not unlike a dog and for for some species uh, compared to some species of dog a lot of snakes and, and reptiles have a better sense of, of uh, scent recognition than even a, a dog. Um, so you can get your frozen rodents out of the freezer and just have them on a bag in the kitchen counter and your snake will be like, hey, bro, I know you got rats out of here somewhere. Yep. <laughs> and they might they might see that heat signature of your hand and be like, that's it. Um, you know, like, they, so it's, it's a super easy mistake to make. And oh, yeah. I think it happens to most people. Mm -hmm. um, I find too that certain species you can snap them out of that that food mode a little bit easier than other mm -hmm. species yeah. through you know hook training or whatnot. But you know, like the womas, you, you're not really going to get them out of that mode, and and they're going <laughs> to chew on you. So yeah. there are certain species where you can generalize that they have a stronger uh, yeah. likelihood of those food bites occurring for sure. But I was going to say also, um, like with my king snake, the problem is that snakes are a food source for them. So yeah. if I <laughs> so sometimes randomly think I'm food is because I've worked with other snakes earlier that day mm. and, not, and didn't wash up my forearm mm -hmm. and that snake scent and it's like oh you know what I mean um so that's something to think about too if you have a non-rodent you know a snake that is uh, prone to eating other snakes and you're also working with other snakes <laughs> yeah there's a few, yeah, I noticed, Riley, that you didn't say the Kribos would be a good uh, beginner uh, snake. <laughs> yeah, I've got some scars from those snakes. <laughs> That's the, Actually, those are the only snakes in my collection or that I've ever worked with that have given me scars from bites. Um, my, my right knuckle on my index finger still feels funny uh, when I close my hand from... Uh, taking a bite from my male on the hand and he's a good seven and a half feet and it's just because they have an unrelenting feeding response um, it doesn't turn off it mm -hmm. does not turn off it goes until it's quenched and you need to you need to have some barrier because they'll literally just go after whatever's moving at a certain point like they just don't stop they it, you flip the switch and it's game on you better have closed toed shoes on and you know not let them on the floor and have something you can put in their mouth fast and then just put them away because they go from zero to berserk real fast <laughs> uh interesting uh i'd love to see one uh get trained down and in, in to, to do target training with something that's, that's oh, that they would smart be, and that food might motivate they would be excellent candidates for target training they are very visually cued in they're very smart this whole time my female's been up here watching me even though she should be nesting because she's gravid <laughs> um they, they're very very tuned in snakes very switched on for that's sure awesome and we're uh, we're coming up to the to the end, and so I do want to hit this uh, this question too for a beginner, because um, something I didn't find out about it's been around for a long time is a nice organization called US ARC, um, mm -hmm. and stands for United States Association of Reptile Keepers. And let's start um, since my camera's on you, Riley. Let's start with the. Uh, will you tell me is that something that a beginning keeper should care about? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, I think it's important for everybody who keeps reptiles to understand um, just period. I think uh, just being aware of what's going on nationwide 
with different states, different counties, um, just so you at the very least can ensure you're not, you know, breaking any laws where you live if you're trying to start keeping reptiles. Because mm-hmm. uh, you can sign up for their their newsletter and just, you know, be an informed keeper. I think uh, to be an uninformed keeper is irresponsible. And uh, I think at least just having your ear to the pavement with them is important. If you can be a member and and support them, I think that's even better. But, uh, you know, life is expensive and I understand most people don't, you know, necessarily have disposable income or maybe you're a kid and you don't have a job. So you definitely don't have disposable income. So, mm-hmm. but at least being informed, I think knowing what USARC is about, what they're uh, doing for us and the, the ongoing initiatives and just being aware because you never know when that that you know opportunity might come knocking on your door where you can actually contribute something positive and really make a difference for them so that's a great point lucas and summer do you have any thoughts on, on us art nothing different just agree with riley completely yep anybody who keeps reptiles um and enjoys having them in their life should know what's going on with them at the very least and hopefully be at a position where they were able to contribute and support and um, help us all be able to keep these animals. Right on. Yeah. What do you think, Lucas? Uh, agreed. hundred percent. You know, in a perfect world, I would love for a beginner to only have to worry about, you mm-hmm. know, learning about their animal, but we are very much not in a perfect world as people who love reptiles right now. And it's super important uh, for everybody to be tuned in and supporting us arc. If you want to continue keeping your new pet. So, um, excellent. And, and for those who, who don't know, US Arc, it's a lob, it's essentially a lobbying group. Um, they do a little bit more. They do quite a bit more than that because they also defend uh, the, I always want to say our right to own reptiles, but let's be honest, it's not a right. It's a privilege. Um, there's nowhere in the Constitution where it says, you know, it's not like Amendment 17. Um, I think we have more amendments than that. That's so embarrassing. I don't, I don't know how many we have. Uh, I'm going to go back to the 10th grade right now and, and learn. Um, but, you know, it's not like the final amendment that says, and you get to keep whatever you pet you want. No, um, there's things that play. We all just went through, we all went through like that's over. Uh, COVID, coronavirus, right? Um, and how many times did you hear, oh, it came from a snake. Oh, it came from a bat. Well, the politicians heard that too. And many of them are saying, well, then we're not going to ship any of them in the United States. Well, if you want a snake, if you want a super dwarf reticulated python or a Bradley python or a black tail Kribo, it's probably not going to come from your city. You're probably going to have it shipped through FedEx overnight. And if that's a law that's illegal in your state, you need to be aware of that because if no one tells the politicians, hey, uh, or the lawmakers, um, actually, this is what's happening and this is what's spreading the disease and they, you know, they don't spread the disease and this common is an industry and it makes so much such money, then they're going to vote no on that because they're going to say, great, we just ended one disease vector or um, we just got rid of a dangerous reptile that's going to become invasive. It's like, no, Burmese pythons are not going to become invasive in Eureka, California. Like you don't have to <laughs> outlaw them there. Like they won't survive. Um, and US Arc went and they talked to, I don't remember the specifics of the Eureka legislation. Mm-hmm. It was just a mm-hmm. local, but mm-hmm. US Arc went and they talked to them and they said, oh, oh, we didn't know. Thank you. Yeah. And then they changed the the, the, the legislation yeah. before they had the vote on it. And um, now people in Eureka get to keep their big snakes <laughs> like yep. uh, or right. get new ones still, because um, I don't think they're going to take away snakes. Where I'm from. But that's good to know. Um, just know that there are there's a whole legal side of that. And that's a whole nother panel that we could do on that, too. Um, one thing uh, in the chat, you guys are talking about not just target training, but puzzle training, feeding too. So again, there's so much, and it's the same with other animals too, not just reptiles. And um, there's so many fun ways to, to train mm-hmm. reptiles. It, it's, mm-hmm. uh, Lori, we really do need to have a, a, a training panel discussion. So, cause we could do an hour and a half on that too. Guys, let's, uh, let's keep moving. Let's go into the lightning round. And this is the last thing we say before goodbye. So ask any, um, any questions you want, if you guys in the chat, uh, while I'm doing this, but I'll, I'll go real quick um, for the panelists, guys. You just have to answer first thing that comes to your mind. Some of these are real easy and the other ones are real stupid. Summer, <laughs> Summer, you first. Is it beer or wine? Wine. Wine. Good answer. Riley, dogs or cats? Cats. Cats. Okay. Uh, Lucas, rocks or plants? Plants. Plants. Summer, favorite dinosaur? 
Uh, Triceratops. Riley, what's your favorite plant? Cactus. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many jokes for that, and I'm just going to not I, say I them. I don't know if there are, but it was it just... <laughs> It's a funny answer, and I, I don't know why exactly, but I like it. Um, that's good. Lucas, are you afraid of spiders? Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. You are? I used to get chased around the vivarium. Chased. My coworkers would take molts of the bird eaters and scare the living you-know-what out of me. Yeah. That's what you're the... Um... You're the first person on the panel that said, yes, you're afraid of spiders. They're the only animals I can't handle. I but blame they... my dad. He showed Thank me arachnophobia at a very young age. The movie yeah. wrecked me. Thank you for being honest <laughs> with us. <laughs> uh, Summer, are you a morning or a night person? For a morning. Morning? Yeah, cool. Um, Riley, what's the most obnoxious first question uh, that someone can ask? You know, what's the most obnoxious question someone can ask about before getting a reptile? What's the cheapest snake you have? <laughs> oh, that's a bad one. <laughs> uh, Lucas, most overrated reptile. Mm. Overrated. Do it. Do it. Can you come back to me? No. Oh. <laughs> Do it. Uh, I know you want to say it. What's the most overrated thing that is a reptile? Is that a different question? Is that? Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, it's the same uh, uh, overrated reptile. Wow. Um, mm, eh, corn snake. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> um, Summer, <laughs> what's the most overrated reptile keeping practice? Overrate oh, bioactive. Uh -huh. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh huh. Riley, what is um, what superpower do you want? Oh, I want to be Spider Man, dude. That's that's <laughs> it. Game over. I'd be cool with that. Would you have to end your podcast with him, Lucas, if he did that? If, if he, he was, was Spider-Man? Spider -Man? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Riley's a yeah, good dude. Maybe. I'll stick around. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Just went um, into the chair. <laughs> and, and Lucas, last question. Comic books or comic book movies? Um, truly for me, neither. Like, I don't do either. But I'll say comic books. Cool. If um, I had to start. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, that's it. Thank you for sticking around. Thank you everyone for, for watching uh, and, and the, the questions that we asked. Uh, if anyone has anything they could add, speak now or forever hold your peace. Otherwise, we'll see you for the next one. Uh, thank you so much, guys. And uh, have a great night. Thank you, guys. Thank have you. A Morelia for the win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Yeah. <laughs>